So except for Joseph, does anybody actually know what Micropub is or have any clue other than, okay, we're going to have some fun then. Um, this should work. Um, so if you go to bafosaco.com, the last post five minutes ago, we'll have a link to the slides that you can open up. It's got some clickable stuff and fun things you can pull through. So let's start with 12 years ago. How many people were on early Twitter when there were like 5,000 clients and you could post to Twitter using almost anything on the planet? Does anybody ba go back that far? Oh, that's sad. So that's, this is why we have a problem that we do today. Um, so they used to have a nice open API. Anybody could post to Twitter. Um, hundreds and hundreds of clients. And eventually they shut that all off and now you use one of maybe 10 clients to post to Twitter. And who owns all of those clients? Can anybody guess? Twitter. Twitter, yeah, Twitter of course. Um, so can anybody name for me I think maybe there's like five or six ways to post to WordPress right now. Can anybody name some of them or your favorites? You can post via email address. Okay, email is an option. It's, I think it's in core. Yeah? Yeah, how about your phone app? You can do it. Yeah, there's phone apps for iOS and Android and probably maybe even one other. How else? Obviously the admin UI, right? Yeah. Or Gutenberg now is an option. Uh, there's a Google Docs add-in that you can post, and that's actually new, I think, in the last year. Uh, and then there's some old legacy X, XML RPC clients like uh, Ulysses. Uh, there are some standalone clients that are built for particularly blogging and blog posts that you can create content in, hit publish, and it will update your website automatically. So what I'm going to talk about today is a new method of doing this and a new way of doing this um, that has a lot more uh, power and flexibility. Um, so I think we're about a year and a half in. This is a W3C recommendation now. It's been built. Uh, it's coded in probably half a dozen different languages, if not more. It's supported by several dozen clients and several dozen servers. Um, these will be some basic resources you can take a look at. This is the technical specification. I don't recommend anyone reads this unless you're a developer and you really desperately need to read it. Better resources are on uh, IndieWeb.org. Uh, there's a list of clients that work and a list of servers. A lot of this stuff is super duper open source in a half a dozen different programming languages. Uh, so very rarely would you need to go write something for yourself from scratch. You can probably take code someone else has written, repurpose a lot of it to get yourself um, pretty far. So the nice part about Micropub is it isn't WordPress specific, which things like Gutenberg or WordPress's own admin UI are. So obviously you can't use, yeah. I know there's a project right now, somebody's working on adapting Gutenberg so you can use it to post to Drupal. But otherwise, all those four or five options we mentioned for posting to your WordPress site only exist within the WordPress ecosystem and nowhere else. Uh, but Micropub is built in such a way that you can post to WordPress, you can post to Drupal. Uh, there's some CMSs like with known that have an endpoint built into it to accept data to post to it with any of these types of apps. Uh, there's also a handful of um, static site generators that you can post to as well. Uh, if you were a company like Medium or Wix or Squarespace, my guess is you could put two developers on it for two or three days, build a a server to accept Micropub into your website, and then all of these clients we're going to talk about today would then be usable for those platforms as well. Um, so this is the fun one that we're all here today, and we're going to chat about this particular one. Uh, it's a plugin in the uh, main repository. About a year ago, uh, it was updated to the most recent version of the Micropub W3C spec. It also has some extensions onto it. 
but even more fun, it's now fully integrated into the WordPress's, into WordPress's REST API. So you can go a lot further, a lot farther with it. Uh, prior to about July of last year, it was written in pure PHP. So it was a little harder to, to deal with in terms of um, uh, standard, uh, standard code. Uh, for those who are using Gutenberg, you can either use that or the classic editor. It will work with both. It doesn't, um, it, it's not integrated into Gutenberg anyway, so there aren't any direct issues that anybody I know has seen or experienced uh, up, up to this point. So configuration. If you're going to create a client that you can use or multiple clients that we can use to post to WordPress, how much configuration do we think is going to be required for a plugin like this? Anybody got any guess, any ideas? Oh, wait. There's nothing there. Oh, there's no configuration really. So you download the plugin, you install it, you activate it, you're done, and it should just work trademark, right? <laughs> um, there, I think there's one small set is set up in the settings, in the writing admin, that will allow you to choose data for posts coming into your website. Are they published automatically? Are they drafts or are they private? I think that's the one setting that actually exists. But other than that, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So if you're going to let some outside client post to your website, the first thing you got to be really worried about is authentication and authorization. Um, has everybody used either, uh, probably the two more common ones are Twitter and Facebook both have OAuth 2 implementations that you can, let's say, sign up to Squarespace and to authenticate and create a Squarespace, or uh, not Squarespace, a SoundCloud account. That's probably a better example. So you want to create a SoundCloud account, you actually log into Facebook, Facebook does the little OAuth 2 dance and then you end up in, oh, now you have a, a, a new account on a new social service. Um, how awesome would it be if we could do that but with WordPress? It'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? It actually already exists, somebody's built it. Uh, it's not only OAuth 2 compatible, but it includes a thing called Indie Auth. Uh, that's an extension of OAuth 2. So the MicroPub plugin has this piece of authentication and authorization built into it, but if you want, there's a more powerful version uh, called IndieAuth that's in the plugin repository that'll do this exact same thing. And uh, as we go through, I'll show you examples of what this looks like. Um, so these are the, if you're a developer or a coder, these are the types of scopes that these clients will ask, or could potentially ask your website, will you let me do these things? So create new posts, update things, delete things, undelete them, or post media to them. So if you wanna post photos or let's say audio files to your media portion of your WordPress site, it'll be able to do all of these things. Um, so the fun part is now, here's a handful of examples of MicroPub clients um, Quill is probably one of the strongest built and most flexible versions of this. And if you can imagine using, it's fairly similar to medium.com's experience or now even the Gutenberg editor experience where you can quickly type in and create little blocks. But if you imagine uh, medium.com's editor, Quill is very similar to that. So you can use an interface similar to that to post to your WordPress site. Um, the two next on that list, Own Your Swarm and Own Your Gram, are implementations that will allow you to connect your Swarm or Foursquare accounts or your Instagram account to your WordPress site. On a very regular basis, I take photos with Instagram's super over-engineered mobile app and I post them to my Instagram account and Own Your Gram watches that account and is authorized to post to my site on its behalf. 
so it will scrape out all of my Instagram data and mirror it exactly on my website. Date and timestamps, GPS coordinates, location data and names, uh, it'll take the title or little post that I put on. All that data moves over to my website. And then I also have a little piece that takes all the comments and likes and sucks those back into the comment section on that same piece of content. So if Instagram were to dis disappear off the planet tomorrow through the use of Micropub and its friend um, WebMention, I own all of my Instagram data and I wouldn't miss a beat. I wouldn't care other than losing the friends who are only stuck on in Instagram. Um, but those two work essentially the same. OmniBear is a fun little browser extension for Chrome and Firefox that implements Micropub and it allows you to post uh, bookmarks, likes, uh, replies, and short status updates or notes from your browser bar. So if you're on a web page that you want to share with someone, you can bookmark it, save it to your website instantaneously and share it out from there. Um, Teacup is a fun little app that tr will allow you to track what you're eating or drinking. And it literally, the only data it takes are the thing you're eating, the thing you're drinking, the date and timestamp, and if you want the location, you can optionally send the location. But there is an implementation, I think, on an iOS watch app that with about two clicks, you can save that, you know, that cocktail you're drinking right now to your website. <laughs> and either you can keep it public, private, whatever you want, but you can save that data almost instantaneously. And it's faster than posting to any, to any other social media website, I think, than anything I've seen. There's a micro pub client called Indie Book Club or indiebookclub.biz. You can take things you're reading right now, use that service, and it will post to your website to say, hey, I'm reading this book or this article, this thing. Um, there's another one that's fairly similar to Quill called micropublish.net that will let you do, I think, full length articles, status updates, bookmarks, likes, replies, and maybe one or two others. There's another one called Screech. If you're a podcaster, you can create a podcast in this app and use Screech to publish your audio files to your website. It's very slick. These are probably, I don't know, eight or so of maybe 20 clients that are out there. Um, so here's an example, we'll, we're gonna kind of walk through it quickly. This is what Quill's interface looks like. You go to the website, uh, I think it's quill.p3k.io is the domain name. The link on here will take you to it. Um, but you log in with your domain name. So in my case, I type in bafosaco.com, I hit sign in, it takes me to the very common looking WordPress login and says, ask me, do I want to give it the ability to create posts, update posts, or post media to my own website? I can pick and choose which ones I want to allow it, and then I click authorize. And this is a very familiar OAuth2 dance, and it takes me immediately back to the posting interface for this client. Uh, compared to WordPress's admin UI, is this clean, dirty, better, worse than what they've got? You still have to give it your password at some point. I don't give it my password at all. It uses, it's, I just, I just OAuth 2 would into my website. Oh, okay, so I, I couldn't do this from my phone and just like nope. start posting. You, you, can't, you can't go to this and type in bafosaco.com and I, ha I have to be logged into my website for that to happen. So if, oh, I, okay. if I wasn't logged in, I would have gotten a login screen that logs me in and then it would have said, hey, okay, so you know. You were logged in. So it, it, it knows I'm logged in automatically and, and goes to the next step. Um, I, I could have I could have thrown that one in there, but essentially I just used OAuth to, to get into my website. Yeah. Is this on, in Gutenberg, does it just turn it into a regular paragraph block? Essentially, yeah. Okay. It just takes it and dumps it right in. Um, so this is the interface for posting a status update or Twitter setup. So you'll notice it's got a, a tweet counter up here. Um, I can put in tags if I want. 
I can put in a slug, I can add a photo. Uh, I have a few endpoints on my website to let me send it to another news service, to Twitter, or if I want to post it to GitHub, I could post it to GitHub. Uh, and then there's a little checkbox that says, look up my location and send my GP uh, GPS coordinates to my website as well. So then we come down to the bottom and you hit post. So instead of being assaulted with the 57 meta boxes in the classic editor or <laughs> the crazy business that Gutenberg now does for me to create a quick status note on my own website, this is a pretty quick, simple, slick solution. I hit pu publish and this is literally what it looks like on my own website. So I've got the note here. Uh, it's taken the GPS coordinates. My site knows what to do with that and gives me a full address. My site even goes out and looks up what the weather was in that location where I'm at. And then it, so cool. it shows I've syndicated it to a WordPress.com address and to a Twitter account. And if you click on that Twitter bird, it will take you to the copy that got sent to Twitter automatically. So I literally logged into this client, typed a few words, couple check boxes, hit publish. It lives live on my site. It goes automatically to WordPress or to uh, Twitter. And then if you're using some other indie web uh, tools like web mention, if you go to my Twitter account right now and click like or reply to this, we can, at the end of the talk, I'll pull it up. But any interactions that happen with this post on Twitter, I'll come back to this same post on my website in the comment section and get displayed there. So again, here's, here's another example. If Twitter disappears and gets bought out next week or shut down or something happens to it, everything I've posted to it in the last four or five years lives on my website with all the commentary and notes and interactions that went with it. Um, this is the bigger kind of quill interface once you look at it. It gives you the ability to post full articles in a Medium or Gutenberg-like way. These, these are notes. You can do uh, events, bookmarks, likes, reposts. Uh, it, you may have to do some work with WordPress to make it support itineraries, but it'll do likes, email, and I think that's GPS location if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you can choose any of those options and they provide you with simple versions like this is the interface for an article. So you put in a title, type your post. If you want to go over here, there's a little click button that you can add photos. So you, it's a full text editor essentially. And then when you hit publish at the top, it sends that data to your website. And because your website has this plugin that knows exactly what to do with all the data it's being fed, you can post it to your website, bang, zoom, you're done. Uh, this is an example of a bookmark. So you can throw a URL in there, give it a name, a description, tags if you want. And with a little bit of setup, you can create syndication points to send your data to other social services if you want. There's also, for a few of these types, there's a quick bookmarklet that you can drag to your browser bookmarklet bar so that when you're on a website, you can click bookmark. It will automatically fetch the URL, put it in there automatically. In fact, on my website, I think I'm using, um, there's a tool called Press This that just got taken out of core in the last year that was used to make bookmarklet posting to WordPress easy. They took it out of core and it's now a plugin. But if I use this tool and a bookmarklet, it will pull the URL in, send it to my website. My website will then go parse that page. And I think it uses micro formats first, schema, JSON, LD, and as a super fallback, it will use uh, OG meta tags to scrape that page to pull out the title, the description of the page, and a featured post. So if you go to look at bookmarks on my website, after I hit publish, my website literally just takes the URL and it sucks in all the rest of the data to create a post on my site to say, hey, I bookmarked something. Um, but it's super slick and super quick and easy. Um, 
In fact, here's one for, this is probably the easiest interface. If there's a tweet that I want to like, I can put a favorite bookmarklet in my browser bar, click on it while I'm on that tweet. It'll suck the U permalink for that UR tweet URL, send it to my website to post it as a like, and it will also automatically, in this case, this has a backend with Twitter's API that it'll automatically like that tweet on my behalf uh, in a quick, easy way. But if you wanna like something online and you wanna own the fact that you liked that so you can remember it and have it on your own website off now in the future sometime, th this one, one field, not 50 fields on your website that you need to fill in or worry about um, here's a, here's an example of teacup. So it gives you recent things, a few default drinks, coffee, beer, cocktails, food, burritos, burgers, a check box for the location. And then you can't see it, it's cut off, but there's a little post button at the bottom, which is what makes this UI really simple enough to do from an Apple watch. Um, but wait, there's more. Um, to me, one of the reasons we all are addicted to Twitter and Facebook, we don't, if we think about it in this perspective, WordPress is 99% posting interface. So when you go to WordPress and you're going to create content, it's all posting interface and then you hit publish and it's there. But nowhere on your website is there a feed reader for you to see and read other people's content. Whereas when you look at Twitter and Facebook, it's 99% reading interface and only maybe one or 2% posting interface. And that's what, and they make it super easy for you to post. Well, you don't need to worry about that with WordPress anymore because now with Micropub, it's way easier to post almost any type of content to your website. But what if there were feed readers that you could read and while you're in the reader, you could type a reply to something and hit publish. With Micropub, it's using this API backend that works with all these other CMSs, not even just WordPress, but you can write a reply and hit publish. That reply goes to your website and lives there, so you always have a copy of it. And if you, you add the uh, web mention plugin, you can send it, it's essentially a new web mentions, a new version of track back or ping back, but on acid. And it makes things look the way you would expect them to look in a traditional comment section. So I can in a reader type a reply, hit publish. It goes on my website. My website sends a ping to the thing I'm replying to, to say, Hey, I mentioned you over there. And then the other side that gets to decide, do I want to display that on my side as a comment or not? Um, but it creates a full circle posting and reading interface uh, within now a WordPress specific uh, setup. There in the micro sub world, micro sub is another spec that essentially takes a feed reader and splits it in two. It creates the heavy infrastructure of polling for feeds and it creates a separate structure for how those are displayed. So you can build a server and build a reader client interface and those two are totally separate things. So if you're trying to build a new feed reader and you're a UI person, you don't need to know all the feed reading specs to be able to do that. You can rely on a client to do that heavy lifting for you. Um, but it also means there now are micro pub clients like indigenous that I'll not only work as a simple feed reader, but if you want to post a note or an article to your website from it, it'll do that as well. So it's not only a reader, but it's a posting interface. And uh, somebody is in the midst, I give them maybe six months and there is a WordPress based micro sub server that you can subscribe to all of your feeds on your own website, read them there. And suddenly your WordPress site is not just a posting interface, but it's now a reading interface as well. Um, hello, okay. Steve Jobs. Uh, so what's the fun of this? 
Obviously, it's pretty easy to use. If you're a beginner, you can download the plugin, start using some of these clients now. It's easy to log into them and authenticate and start using them. But if you're a developer, uh, there is a micropub.rocks um, test suite. So if you're building a client or a server, there's all kinds of stuff you can test it against, uh, in addition to a lot of open source code that's been writ written already. Obviously, there's some huge network effects. If you can write a posting interface that not only works just with WordPress, but could work with Drupal and Joomla and every other CMS on the planet, there's more incentive. You could run something like that as a business, which is what a lot of Twitter developers originally started out doing was they were building these really lovely interfaces to interact with Twitter until Twitter pulled the rug out from underneath them. Micropub is completely open source. It's a W3C spec, so you could very easily build a business for creating client interfaces for this type of stuff. Um, and obviously because it is leveraging uh, OAuth 2, there's a lot more privacy and security uh, versus some of the old, you know, you gotta be really old to know what Meta Weblog was or Atom Pub even back in the day. Um, so there's a handful of experimental extensions on Micropub that exist already. So things like visibility is the post you send to your website, public or private. WordPress, the WordPress implementation already does this. So you get to choose. Uh, it'll also do location visibility. Um, you can pull in data from your WordPress website into a Micropub client, which is a fun thing for editing posts. And that's one of the fun features of Micropub. I haven't seen anybody built it yet. I've heard rumors there are one or two working on it. But if you have Micropub uh, servers that work for Drupal and WordPress, you can use this query feature to pull data, let's say from the horrible Drupal site you don't enjoy anymore, pull all that data out of your Drupal site into a third party client, and then you can hit publish to your brand new WordPress install, and suddenly you now have a one-to-one -one import export that is seamless between two massive CMSs. And probably, I imagine sometime in the next two years, somebody's gonna finish building this infrastructure so that you can move from one CMS to another almost instantaneously uh, and in a standards-based way. Um, so why is all this fun other than you now have all these new clients that you can post to your website with. Um, part of it is a plurality. You can, because it's an open spec and it works on the web anywhere, you can code it in any language you want. You could come up with a totally JavaScript, you know, definition of this. You can write it in PHP, Rust, Perl, whatever language you want to write it in. And my guess is most of the major languages are out there. Somebody's written an implementation in that language already. So in the open source world, you don't even need to do it yourself. Uh, but my favorite thing is better UI. So one of the things I loved about the, all the competition in Twitter clients when you could do that was most of the Twitter clients that were out there were actually nicer publishing interfaces to post to Twitter than Twitter, Twitter's own service itself. Somebody had a, an early web UI for how post to Twitter worked earlier today, and it was just the ugliest thing ever. And it's, it's really not that pretty now, but it opens up to a lot more innovation. So uh, the nice part is, let's say tomorrow medium.com pivoted for the sixth, seventh time. They could take what has been called the billion dollar typewriter and support Micropub, and you could use their lovely fancy interface, authenticate to your WordPress website, create your content in Medium, and then when you hit publish, instead of it publishing to a Medium URL, or maybe it does that too, but it also sends all that data to your WordPress site. And so suddenly now you can leverage that pretty posting interface, and maybe Medium charges five bucks a month for that. I, I would actually pay for that over five bucks a month for content that they might want to feed me. Um, 
But the nice part is it MicroPub's already supported in a half a dozen CMSs, so it becomes an actual business opportunity because you can use it to publish everywhere and not just on WordPress. Um, so custom interfaces, how many agency people or developers do we have who have clients who are irksome and annoying to them? <laughs> For the camera, I'll say everybody in the room raise their hand. <laughs> Um, the nice part about this is you don't have to train your clientele as much. You don't have to show them what all these meta boxes or how Gutenberg works. You can say, here's where the title goes, here's where the body goes, here's how you add a photo, hit publish, you're done. It's very simple, there's nothing additional above and beyond that. Um, I mentioned the import-export piece earlier. Uh, so we can wrap up with this. What if Gutenberg itself were a MicroPub client? Somebody, I imagine, within the next year is going to take the finished version of what Gutenberg is and you can log into a WordPress.com or WordPress.org site, compose everything in Gutenberg, and hit publish, and maybe not necessarily publish it to your WordPress site, but I, let's say maybe Squarespace opens up a little and adds an endpoint. You can add it there. Um, so if you have, I'll be around if you have additional questions, but there's a bunch of resources at IndieWeb.org. There is a 24-7 live chat where there are an inordinate number of people who've either implemented this in multiple languages or for multiple platforms. If you have questions and you want to build something yourself, they are super helpful. And even if somebody can't help you at 3 a.m. In, in, in the U.S. time, there's somebody in Europe who's awake who's done this who probably can help you out. They have both a general chat and a developer channel, depending on what level you want to get this up and working with. Um, and that's all we've got. So, questions, comments, snide remarks. Yeah. I noticed on the interfaces, um, there wasn't any um, way to style the text. Is that pretty standard? That's you know, because you're you're typing raw words in here to compose it, and when you publish it to your website, your website's taking it as standard paragraph setups and your your website's doing the theming for that so your website has the css to take those pieces now if you want to do other custom setup like that you easily could do that and send that data along as well mm -hmm. um, i'm not aware offhand of any clients that have done that for doing like uber custom level inline css although i imagine you could probably type raw html into that quill editor to get inline styles if you wanted to. I've, I haven't tried it personally, but it's, it's, it's generally sending raw HTML as a, a push and pull request or get request and doing it that way, so. I have a really sticky question for yes. you. Yes. So with GDPR style stuff where people will one day decide they want to delete their Twitter account and let's say you and I have had Twitter conversations that end up on your website. What happens What happens when, you know, obviously I delete my Twitter, that won't affect your personal website. But as the website owner, are you accountable for the fact that I corresponded with you in the past? Does that create some sort of I, legal gray area? I, I could be if I were in Europe, but I am not in Europe. And, <laughs> and uh, most of GDPR, I think, big swaths of it don't apply to small personal websites. Uh -huh. If Now, if I'm a major corporation, yeah, then I'm responsible. And I, if you, uh, you see that data is there and ask for it to be removed, I would be responsible for removing it, I think. Okay. Um, so there is that. Um, if your site is using the web mention setup and you reply to my site directly, uh, web mention supports the ability to delete posts and send 410s. So you could send a, a delete and then re-web mention my website and my website would respect that and automatically remove that comment. Okay. 
that is super cool. So, yeah, yeah so that exists. have it installed. I would delete it, and it would delete off both sites. Yep. That's cool. Or it at least would delete publicly from my site. Okay. I, could I could still keep the data in the back end okay. of my website, but it would unpublish it, essentially. So, That's yeah. They've, they've thought of that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Does it support categories in WordPress if you want to publish this way only in one category, not like general post? I saw tags. Yeah, there was a... You can go back here. There's a tags. Um, so what happens in this case, and I think in Quill it's comma separated and it creates a discrete tag. So what it does is it'll send that data to your WordPress site and the Micropub plugin will check first to see does that already exist and if it does, if it does as a category, it'll put it in a category, and then secondarily, it'll create, it'll put it as a tag. If it doesn't exist, it'll create a new tag for it as a default, to my knowledge. So it, so it, most of, most of these clients use tags as a kind of general catch-all, whereas WordPress separates categories and then tags as two separate taxonomy levels. Um, but if I send it a category and a tag in this field, my website will know, hey, there's a category with that name, so I'm going to use the category, and then the other one then becomes a tag. So it'll, it'll do that automatically. And different, different servers will have different implementations of that, so it may be drastically different in terms of how that's implemented in Drupal because Drupal uses different taxonomy setups. So each, each individual CMS can make those decisions of what the endpoint, it's going to receive data and it's going to know what, the data is going to be marked up in such a way that it'll know what to do with those pieces of data. Or things like um, WordPress has fields and it has meta places where you can store GPS coordinates. But let's say you haven't set up anything on your site to show those GPS coordinates or do anything with them. So it won't display them, but it'll save them in the meta for you four or five years later on. So the data will exist in your website and it'll be in the database. And then it's up to you to decide what to do with that and how do you display it or not. On my, I think in my example, you know, I show it as a little, you know, arrow icon. And because I'm logged in, you can actually see, okay, that I'm posting from my home. But if you're not logged into my website and you look at this, you, I don't think you'll see, you won't see that location set up. And you may, you may not see the weather either, but it's, it's up to you as the website owner to, to decide how do I display, but most of the generic stuff, things like photos, um, articles that you may write or status updates are just going into the, the body as kind of bulk text. So in using this with a client? Yes. Yeah, and you can, because of the way the Indie Auth implementation is set up, you can have a multi-user site. So each user can log in with, so typically what you'll do in that case, you won't use, on my site it's bafosaco.com and it uses the root domain. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a multi-author site, you would use the author slash author name URL that exists on a core functionality, you'd use that URL and log in with that and then it would authenticate and give that person a bearer token for that client. So each person in each account on a per account or per user basis is then authenticated to post with whichever clients they... And image that's uploaded, is it uploaded as a feature image? Um, or is it just added to the article? It's not at the moment, it's within the implementation, and there are a handful of uh, both filters and hooks that you can play around with mm -hmm. when it accepts. So the default, I think, is if you throw a photo in there, it's going to show up in the body of the text. Okay. But uh, you can play around with the data that's coming into your endpoint and say, take the first photo and make that the, the featured image, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So. 
Um, so now instead of the five we had in the early slide ways, and my guess is almost none of you, except for maybe Joseph, is posting by email. And even then, I bet you he yeah, probably I don't he never. Because I'm afraid that uh, that the email will start getting spammed if I activate that feature. Yeah, yeah. Because there you go. How it is with email. Um, <laughs> but my guess is most of you use maybe two methods at best to post to your site. Now you have about 20 that are quick and simple and easy, and way less UI, way less cruft than you did before. Uh, personally. And since we've got a few minutes, I can pull it up. If I can get this guy to go away. I'm hoping, um, uh, I'm which up. So I have. <laughs> uh, so this is the front page of my website. So I have a handful of additional post types. So in my mind, post formats didn't go far enough with their seven or eight. Um, so we can do a couple examples. What's a what's a fun one? Uh, here's a custom one. So if I annotate and highlight stuff on websites, I use a tool for it. That tool then uses, it's, uses a simple RSS feed, but it will pull in the URL. I, I'm using the URL. It goes and automatically scrapes the title, the photo, and the author link and name, and then gives you the highlighted text that I found. Um, just for fun, you can, you can click on a little, you can click on a little link and it'll take you to that page and scroll down so you can see here's the thing I actually annotated with the highlight of the thing that I physically annotated. Um, can, you, can you scroll down so we can see your daily activity over three months? Uh, sure. <laughs> I wanted to see this. Oh, wow. So blue is posts, orange is comments, and then this goes back five years. So you can tell when I started owning more of my data, instead of posting it just to Twitter or Facebook, I started owning it all in a big chunk and uh, have gotten, you know, all my social media comments, I get more from Twitter and GitHub. So I can actually, on my own website, I can post issues to GitHub. I write it and compose it on my website. I hit publish, syndicate it to GitHub, it puts it onto GitHub because GitHub has an API for doing this. And then if you reply to that GitHub issue or queue or whatever it is, I have a service that will scrape that data, bring it back to my website and show you what that looks like. So that gets pulled back in. So um, if you have questions about how to own more of your data in social media silos, um, I have. I have a question. Sure, sure. Do you I think that this is like drastically transformed your own website traffic. Like, do you see? Oh, that? dramatically. Yeah. But I also now have way more internal cross-linking and linking out to other things. So when I search for a lot of times, when I search for names of friends that I know directly who have commented either in social media areas or on my site. If I do Google searches for them and their photos, almost all of them come from my own website, <laughs> high up in Google image searches, because the SEO on my site is way better than it is on anything they're doing in social media. So all their photos are from me and my site rather than from their impressions. Yeah, that's um, right. It's also taking your search criteria. Well, it knows that you search your site on Google a lot, so it will prioritize that as well. Yeah. So I commented back to you on the testing oh. out Quill with WordPress posts. It's purely safe for, uh, for this. <laughs> for, yeah, okay. But I want to see if my reply may have shown So which post for this one? Testing out Quill with WordPress. So here, so here I, when I logged in this morning, uh -huh. I checked in on Swarm. And we can go to Swarm and see this is what it looks like. Oh, it's going to make me log in to see it because it was private. Um, but here's the photos I took as I walked in this morning and checked in. And that stuff automatically lives on my website. Um, I sent a tweet this morning, but it came from my... So I use WordPress essentially as my Twitter client of choice. I post on my site. and s Actually, I post in Quill, which posts to my site and then sends it to Twitter. So... Yeah. 
And whether you're using, the nice part is if you're a designer or developer and you want to create an application to post to WordPress, some custom, I, it can be anything you want, you know, food related. Uh, I'm waiting for somebody to do something exercise related so you can take your Apple Watch and say, hey, this is my, you know, hit one touch and here's my pulse rate right now after I'm exercising, log it to my website. But you can log it privately so that it's not public facing. I, three quarters of the content of my website is on the back end and only I can see it. Um, so which one was it? The testing? Yeah, testing this one? Well, so I, I sent you a comment on Twitter and I'm so here's oh, yeah, <laughs> so, there so there's your comment shows up and it shows here too that it came from Twitter and if I want I can click on it and go see your original nice. and the threaded comment. <laughs> um, so the, the other nice part too, uh, and most people don't know this, uh, on my, if I click reply, there's actually a, uh, there's a custom URL that WordPress gives. So if I reply to you, this is the URL I would send to Twitter and that allows then the conversation to be threaded both entirely on my site and entirely on Twitter. So you have no idea ever in, this, in most senses that I'm replying from my website and that the entire conversation is mirrored on my site. You choose to use Twitter and hey, good on you, that's your problem. Yeah, well there, there's a thing on Twitter and I, I've seen you reply to my, my comments on Twitter and it says that you sent it from uh, Quill. Yeah. Which is actually a really cool feature that they implemented to let you know what how people yeah. are interacting with Twitter. So and I so kind of like the, like that. Within that there's some settings in the web mention plugin that'll allow me to to uh, face pile likes and replies mm -hmm. um, for journalists and bigger publications we've been working on one called Reads. So, uh, ooh, what just happened there? Um, so typically I'll put, every, I don't always post them publicly, but I log everything I read online. If I read an article or a piece of a page, I have a little bookmarklet that automatically takes the URL, scrapes it, gives me all of this data, date and time stamps it, and then if I want to add tags or categories, and that way four months from now when you ask me a question, oh, I read this article somewhere, I can actually look for it on my website, find it, here's your link, you can read the same thing I read. But this sends notifications to everybody who read those things. So, let's see if I can find a good one. I think she sent me one recently. I think she accepted accept them. So I read this post on Kimberly Hirsch's website and somewhere down here, oh, she's, she doesn't have the thing, but it says reading and there are a couple indicators that a few people read this post, which is a different semantic level of I liked it, which on Twitter means how much? Nothing. Like it means I read the headline. Okay, great. Um, or uh, in her case, she's got a few mentions. So if you click on those, it will take you to web pages where people actually physically mentioned this URL on her site in her thing. Can we so. on those? On the mentions? Let's see. Oh, a couple of them came from my website. But she's not, she's chosen not to do the full URL where those mentions came from. She's hiding that data. And so it only says that it's it's me, this website mentioned her, not. But, you know, as you saw two minutes ago, when I searched for her, I got to her page from the place where I actually mentioned her. So. Most importantly, she gets to choose how her website displays information rather than, than just letting the platform display. Yeah, yeah. So if there's abuse and you're getting spam from Twitter, let's say you can hide all that stuff or because WordPress has both a kismet for spam as well as other tools, you can filter spam out, but you can also choose to leave it in the moderation queue 
and not actually publish it on your website because you don't agree with maybe their politics, maybe. Um, Thanks, Chris. So, great. yeah. Hey, it is that time. Thanks. So.